Welcome everyone. Uh, it is a very much a Linux talk. Um, I'm currently studying at Rhodes in the InfoSec department, so it's something I've been working on for my master's thesis. Uh, the master's thesis is not done yet, but I'm going to kind of share where I am so far um, and why I chose this topic. Um, so hope you all follow. It's going to be a bit more introductory than really deep diving, but uh, let's see how it goes. Um, who am I? A uh, little bit of everything. Um, most recently, built in tech app. Uh, like I said, doing CompSign info security, besides Cape Town, a WASP. Um, so more from the Cape Town side, but I usually come up for PyCon this time of the year. Um, Twitter and the rest. Um, what is B-Sides? So I always like to plug it a little bit because it's at the end of the year. So we do a InfoSec conference run by hackers, for hackers. Uh, we do one to two tracks as well. We do badges, a uh, little electronic badge built on an ESP32 with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. There will be a game on it with a screen. Uh, it looks like that. Um, that's one of the tickets that we have is to actually get the badge and then we'll have a prize at the end of the day for whoever gets the highest score. Um, we're a bunch of guys from Cape Town who just enjoy uh, cybersecurity a lot and just get together to do a bunch of fun things on the day and it's like our hacker summer camp every year. Um, even have a hacker jeopardy at the end. Um, so the general like outline for for today's talk, a problem, the logs, um, why system calls, uh, a little bit about containers because I also touch on that natural language processing and anomaly detection. And just quick disclaimers, more introductory research is 100% complete. I'm not a machine learning expert, I'm actually just a Python dev. Um, but it's been interesting how a little bit of uh, studying and uh, a lot of tools that are open source and easy to use are quite uh, powerful. And sorry if there's a lot of text, there is a lot of theory coming up. And sometimes I feel like I sound like this when I talk, so stop me, bear with me. Uh, at least I've slept more than last year when I spoke at PostgreSQL and PyCon. Um, but hopefully uh, the idea is that you get an idea of what I'm talking about and then see if it's relevant to your own lives and how you can apply it. Because um, it's not necessarily just a security problem. Um, there's a Kubernetes talk earlier. We're all generating a ton of logs these days. These microservices. Each team writes their own logs. They're all different. Um, and analyzing logs, especially for a security team or a incident response team, is is a pain. And um, time series can also be a pain if the log's not in the right format, dates wrong. Um, these are all kinds of problems that we've all dealt with before. And um, why I'm looking into this is to look at actually doing anomaly and vulnerability detection other than just static analysis um, and um, not dynamic analysis as analyzing the binary or um, live events, but actually looking at the tools that we already have, which are logs. Um, we have a ton of them. And there's a high noise ratio, as is with any um, security kind of uh, problem uh, or any tool at the moment. Everyone's claiming that there's, um, they've got the next tool, but there's a high um, ratio of um, false events or uh, a lot of noise. And um, the basic hypothesis is can we use natural language processing and machine learning techniques to scale and identify previously unknown detections of vulnerabilities? So are logs close enough to our natural languages that we can use the tools that we're currently using for transcribing or text-to-speech, etc., to actually 
um, or even just classifying documents to find issues if we take a log and we treat it as a document or we treat the first log as a baseline and a second document comes along, can we find an anomaly in that document and maybe just in a line? And anomaly detection is not new. Elasticsearch has had this for a while. They recently bought a SIEM company. Um, they're very big into point anomaly detection um, and actually bought a company that was doing this. So it's, it's not a new and novel concept. And um, you also have many various types of anomalies. You've got point anomalies, contextual anomalies, and collective anomalies. But um, primarily what I've looked at is just a point anomaly detection. So I'm not trying to solve detection. I'm merely trying to see if we can detect. And then if we, if we can have a notification for someone to actually go look deeper. So if we can find a document that's anomalous, we've already narrowed down the problem slightly. Um, so, I mean, Linux has a lot of logs that we can look at, um, but primarily I've looked at system call logs. Um, I quite like system call logs. There's been a couple of times that I've found some interesting things in running systems, and it tells you a lot about um, what's happening in the kernel, um, and um, it's quite well documented as well. So um, we have a quick example of just open, um, opens a file specified by path name, um, and uh, a ton of uh, other syscalls. Um, for this research, I fo focus mainly on Linux. I mean, we've got BSD and Windows. They all have their own syscalls. I'm not looking at anything as crazy as uh, SmartOS um, doing Linux uh, branded zones or anything as crazy as that, and mostly on x86 so that um, I know which syscalls that I'm working with. And because um, of my own machine, I'm mostly focusing on n newer um, syscalls in the kernel and whatever is backwards compatible. And just an example of a syscall without the date, of course, but um, right off the bat, you can see that there is some human language there. Um, it's written by a human being, so we should be able to read it. Um, and then I also looked at easier ways to, to get to syscall logs. Um, Sysdig is building a whole monitoring solution around uh, containers, um, which is why I kind of looked at it, because it supports Kubernetes, Docker, OpenShift, even Mesos has some cloud capabilities, and then just actual deep diving into the host and the container itself is why I actually looked at it. Um, because instead of having to find the process IDs, um, sysdig actually allows you to specify the container name or the image name, and it knows exactly where to go look for it. It does install a kernel module, which is a pain, which um, unfortunately that demo is not going to work thanks to secure boot and some other things on the new laptop. Um, but that's generally what it looks like. Um, so it also gives you an idea of the direction, um, the dates. And it's similar to the normal um, S-trace kind of output, but slightly different. And um, I found it personally a little bit easier to read, so I thought that would be a good source um, to, to test on. Um, and why I found it relevant is um, I'm, I'm big on app security, so uh, a lot more Docker-based containers and a lot more um, kind of just an attitude of it's more secure now, but we still have a host with a TCP, uh, a TCP daemon, and a lot of things that can still be attacked. So. Um, also, the syscalls tells me a lot about what's going on, what it's trying to access, um, and if I've got an ELF binary without um, loading it to IDA Pro or something like um, Cutter, I can still see what it's trying to do if I isolate it enough and look at the syscalls. And obviously, some syscalls we 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 tend to see as more dangerous as others, or we can see that it's making TCP connections out. 
Um, but obviously, Cisco also have some issues. Uh, I was running into gigs, um, doing five-minute runs on certain Docker containers, lots of frequent events. Um, with Sysdig, a lot of permissions to be able to install a kernel module. S-Trace also has um, you having to run as an admin and then also shipping it off the host and client at quite a high frequent uh, frequency. And then um, why did I also look at containers other than an interest is um, they're much more isolated. Um, so with isolation, I'm trying to decrease more log noise um, so that I focus mostly, mostly on what the application's doing, not what the system's doing. Um, and because Docker has a daemon that's susceptible to exploitation, we've seen it in the last two years, a couple of exploits coming out, and even just the file system itself has had some um, exploits. Um, because of Sysdig as well, allows me to look at the container itself. Um, and also, um, there's a lot more tooling around Kubernetes and containers, and then, um, I found interesting that when Google released Python 3.7 in Google Cloud, they also released Google's Gvisor, a type of hypervisor to further isolate, a, a micro hypervisor, but somewhat of a proxy in a hypervisor to isolate containers even more than um, by default. And um, further kind of isolating, if I want to find somewhat previously unknown vulnerabilities. Um, Docker has a default SECOMP or Linux secure uh, compute mode uh, default um, config. So um, I want to kind of isolate the usual suspects and ignore them. So Docker already does this. You can add even more um, configs to it, more um, isolated configs. But they also, it gives you an idea of what they're looking for because they have specific older um, syscalls that they're already blocking or things like mount and clone, which um, could allow the actual container, the, the client to mount into other containers or the host itself. Um, like I said, it adds more, more rules and um, I can also even add additional profile and um, that was kind of at one point the focus of the research, but I'm not going to focus as much on it, that through what you find that you then start creating profiles to add to Docker containers to further harden them because you don't know what to protect. Um, what you don't know is a problem. And Google's Gvisor and even Docker, the default's kind of just the default that they've um, come up with. So just here's a, just an example of a uh, further SecComp that you could add to a container um, which prevents chmod um, and how you would actually apply that is with a profile in JSON um, as a security option and you can even disable SecComp on a Docker container if you really wanted to just run it as uh, close to what you expect as possible. Um, just to give you an idea of how Google's Gvisor works. So usually you have a lot more um, VM or hypervisor, another kernel running, but what it's, what it's doing in Golang is adding a kind of proxy between uh, syscalls and network calls um, with some isolation to protect the host kernel as, as much as possible. So um, they, they do know that Docker has some isolation, but they want to add additional isolation for each container, and you're even able to do this on Kubernetes now. Um, so let's get into a bit more around natural language processing. Is everyone still following, by the way? Everyone's still good? Not too crazy yet. Okay. Um, so... Partially why I'm looking at this is I've looked at a lot of logs in my life and trying to get developers all to do the same kind of log is a pain. Um, but it shouldn't stop us from trying to at least address um, using all of the logs. And um, 
it's at least partially written in a natural language or language that we as developers understand. Um, but there's still a lot of challenges around actually processing it and the various techniques that will work. And um, what I'm trying to do is augment. I'm not trying to automate, remove. Um, I'm not trying to build the next uh, Silicon Valley startup, not at all. Um, we merely want to augment our existing ways of analyzing logs. So if grep still works for you, that's an excellent tool. And if you're able to identify something, you pass it to grep and you're able to further analyze much more fine grained. And to visually kind of just explain what we're, we're trying to do is um, we're, we're aware of kind of a baseline. We can run a basic container that we've seen before that we know we've secured and we can transform it into some kind of, or, or the logs that we've got from the baseline, we can transform into something um, numeric which we can then put in a model and we can um, use the model through training and testing to then give it some new data, some new log lines, some new documents and we can look for anomalies within that specific document because if, um, if we look at any kind of syscall log, um, there's a lot of repetition, there's a lot of normal um, a lot of noise already, so um, I'm not too interested in the usual allocation of memory as as something starts up. Maybe I'm, I'm more interested maybe in these couple of lines where it's it's accessing the network, um, it's trying to open files or check if files are there, um, and as our baselines also change, we can add them and then further detect um, new anomalies that we might find and then report on it and act. Um, and so we, what we want to do is tokenize the, the logs from a human number into something, I'm trying to be as, as, as simplified as possible um, because I'm not sure how far the, the audience's knowledge might might be, but let's, let's use for instance um, a way of of just looking at the count of something. So we've got two sentences and that is how we would actually represent the occurrences of it um, just so that we have some kind of matrix that we can actually um, do work on. And um, I looked at a lot of uh, different tokenization methods because um, as we already know, different logs have different formats, um, might use white spaces, uh, pipes, it can be all over the place. So the first uh, kind of tokenization, it's easy to, to use is just looking at white spaces. So here we at least have something where the white spaces are used properly so we can tokenize each section and we're, we're able to see that um, this is a syslog kind of log that we are able to see the date um, and telnet call root. Um, it works fairly well, but it might not work well in every situation. If the log format's not followed every time, it might fall apart. Um, we look at a tree bank tokenizer, which was an interesting one um, because they actually use, um, if I remember correctly, they used words coming from newspapers and it's quite accurate as well. You can see it does get the date quite well. Telnet, call, gets root. Um, so you can go down a quite a, a long path of looking at many different tokenizers. Um, one that I looked at was actually just hashing um, each occurrence um, because it was quite a fast and somewhat efficient one sometimes. Um, and um, the only, the, the big downside though is that you can't retrieve feature names again once, once you've used it. Um, but essentially we're taking each log line, so we break up a document, each one is a separate log line, and we tokenize it a bit and then we hash each occurrence. So we hash the date, we hash localhost, 
sudo pam unix and we get a sparse matrix encoding so something that we can use in a model um, so um, works fairly well um, found a lot of um, examples of people using this um, and just quickly graphing some of it wasn't a very big log, but um, what I'm trying to do here is, I think I was just using strace and ls, just as an example. Um, I'm doing two kind of runs with it, one where strace finds the file and one where it doesn't. So just to give you an idea of the differences, the red dots being the one where it didn't find it, and the green one being where it did. But you can see that um, you can somewhat see the differences and some patterns in that. Um, also looked at this vectorizer term frequency inverse document frequency, um, which is great as it, um, it it looks at the whole document and its frequency not only in the lines but the document itself. Um, um, but I haven't done enough research in this. I've mostly focused on the hashing vectorizer. And then um, once we've we've um, tokenized everything, we've got our, some of our data, we actually want to start classifying. Um, and at least in my research, it's somewhat of a binary classifier because mostly what I want to know is normal and abnormal or anomalous and not anomalous. Um, and we want to start grouping uh, bits of data together and um, yeah, I'll classify it. Um, so, I mean, uh, one of the best examples, and it's used, um, we, we see this pretty much every day thanks to Gmail and Outlook, is spam detection, where essentially we want to identify a spam email as either spam or not spam so that you get your actual emails in your inbox and the spam emails in the spam inbox. Um, there's a lot of training data for it, um, and when it's trained uh, well and accurately, it has a pretty good um, success rate. So, looked at a couple of classification methods, um, logistic regression, cart, random forest, and k nearest neighbor. Um, so, I mean, essentially a lot, because it's just a master's thesis, I don't want to oversolve or um, I want to find something simple enough that um, others can use as well and on further research we can look at other things um, and um, KNN being a lazy learning algorithm um, we 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 work out the the, the nearest uh, neighbor as, as a way to classify um, points in our database or our, our matrix um, and a, a stupid little quote for it, birds of the feather flock together um, as a kind of like way to show that um, we give it a, um, a a number for K so that we um, we test um, how effective it is on the distance from from its neighbors and start classifying things um, based on a single data point. So all the other classes we've already trained on and we add a new data point and we see where it classifies better in what class. Um, and it stores the entire data set. Um, and it's, it's easy to do because you're not doing a lot of training. Um, and it's kind of a just-in-time calculation. So um, I want to keep it simple. I want something that people can actually implement um, and if it's something where we, we're doing a lot of logs and um, we want to be able to to implement it easy and, and it works fast. Um, so an example of this, uh, we take another log line and we've tokenized it and we work out the vector um, for its neighbors to classify it and um, just to maybe reiterate this point, um, a lot of this research is not just in security anomaly detection, but in your CI pipelines, uh, errors, um, crashes, any kind of log where we're trying to find 
just something that's completely not expected based on a baseline that we've had before. So you add a new feature into your software, it crashes, and you're able to see in the logs that that it's it's so different to the rest. Um, just uh, another example of something I ran um, to look at, at how it worked. And then um, I've started looking at this, but I haven't done quite enough on it, is to actually use a random forest um, as a classifier. It's, in some cases, it's, it's quite, quite effective, and you try and work out um, points around it to classify it. Um, Kanin is just much simpler at the time for me to implement, where um, I want to look at this further um, as it's quite good in anomaly detection specifically. And um, yeah, so um, obviously a focus on Linux logs, microservice world, and it's the kind of the things that I'm interested in. Um, and um, so once I started looking at how to actually process the logs, I actually started looking at um, sources of data to use. So um, I, I can easily get a Ubuntu to run as kind of a baseline or an application on it, but then I also need anomalous behavior. So I started looking at VirusTotal has a academic access to um, everything they found between 2017 and 2019. And I actually, there's a lot of Windows stuff in there as well, and just started focusing on the ELF binaries. Um, and still there's thousands of examples. And then uh, further started narrowing it down to um, to x86 systems. There was a lot of ARM-based stuff uh, like Mariah, um, and even non things you wouldn't expect at, at all. Um, to use an example, one of those in it, the Mariah, um, the Mariah botnet. So to look at, um, it wouldn't be specific to this research. It's just an ex uh, interesting example because it was targeting IoT devices and creating a DDoS botnet. Um, and let's see, I'm hoping that things won't go too too badly, but um, on a new machine. Um, so here, it's just a simple example. None of this is, um, is what I'm submitting yet, but just some of what I've done. Um, here I've run, uh, so maybe just to talk about kind of the architecture or the setup that I did, the, the testing system. So I've used KVM with uh, Kimu just to uh, virtualize a host and using KVM to try and get around the classic things that malware looks for because Mariah and all of the ELF binaries are some kind of malware. They usually look for things that VirtualBox and VMware leaves, um, kind of metadata or naming conventions for their their networking devices, their CPUs and stuff like that. Um, so I've used KVM and Kimu. Then inside of the the VM, I've then installed uh, just the Docker daemon with Google's GVisor, and Google's GVisor is a uh, they call it a no configuration setup. You just add it in a config, um, allowing the Docker daemon to start it, um, and it swaps out the run SC, and you have to just pass it in as a flag when you run the Docker container. So then um, I started out just by running a basic Ubuntu, um, the Docker standard Ubuntu. Just run that for a couple of minutes, and then store the sysdig, um, syscall log. Um, then I took an example, can't remember exactly which malware it was, but a malware that um, did a couple of networking and um, a lot of messing with the file system. Also ran that for the exact same time and then used those two bits of data um, 
and then So yeah, mostly the chemo and the um, KVM was to isolate my own system a little bit. I'm using some of the samples that um, won't won't do too much damage, so I'm able to check in virus total um, what they do. So here's some of the result, some of the actual Cisco logs that I got back, um, and then just doing a little bit of cleanup on the data, um, just to um, remove some of the the log that I wasn't using at the time. Um, and then I start using the hashing vectorizer. So um, this being a 16 gig machine, um, uh, the logs were massive. So I actually started just um, using a part of the, the document up to 10,000 lines of each document um, for this one. Um, when, when I do the full logs, um, I'm spinning up EC2 instances so that I have more memory to, to run them with. But um, like I said before, the hashing vectorizer is keeping, um, is actually quite memory intensive. And um, just to get an idea of the size of the vector shape and um, then I'm just plotting it to get some idea of uh, what it looks like. And um, the green obviously being the baseline. Um, I'd further clean it up in my, my research, but you can see the kind of differences in between um, in the red. Um, And then we start looking at actual um, the classifying everything with uh, with the k nearest algorithm, um, just looking um, uh, taking the the file data of the the malware and then comparing it to the baseline um, and then starting to change the k n number and seeing. Um, what we get um, and trying to to kind of train and change the classification and um, I mean so far most of it hasn't um, hasn't needed a, a massive machine but um, we're able to to just start classifying things and in the further research, then um, I'd start pulling out specific examples. Um, I'm looking at um, not just malware, but actual um, just exploits, running just them, comparing it to baselines. And then I'm also not just using Ubuntu, but Nginx, uh, MySQL, because uh, Google's Gvisor is quite um, specific about which programs they don't um, support yet, which give me a couple of interesting hints of the problems they had. And then a month later, something like Postgres was actually able to run in Gvisor. So these are the baselines that I want to use because um, of what they're, um, what they're trying to protect. Just as a quick example um, of the TFID, Vectorizer, um, taking a similar size, um, we get some interesting results in data that, um, this is a quite recent one, so I'm not going to be able to go into too much detail, but we see a, a, a specific pattern and kind of outliers. And this is also with the, the actual uh, malware sample. This is. Um, Um, yeah, I might be going too fast, so um, how much time do I have left? Five minutes, okay. Um, questions? So, I mean, I'm trying to do this somewhat introductory. Um, next year, I'd like to come back and actually give proper results of how far I got with this. Um, and then I actually want to take it further than just security and syscall logs and kind of... Um, 
because I've I've found a uh, Apache, uh, not Apache. I found some projects, open source projects, that started looking at things like um, Kubernetes and um, other projects logs, but they were quite um, structured logs, logs that um, we already knew the structure would always be the same, and processing them with machine learning and, and giving reports. So the idea being that I want to start um, improving this to the point where I'm able to throw any unstructured log into it and uh, pull out anomalies, and then um, with further human analysis look at um, misses or false false positives and then um, enabling the ability to then go to a specific service or a document and then further investigate. Hi. Hi. Uh, do you not think that by going down to individual tokens you're over granularizing? Um, I've had quite a lot of success by using phrases as regexes and then searching files for that. I'm, I'm talking about logs like DB2 diagnostic logs and SQL output and stuff like that, but it, uh, it yes. seems a lot simpler. I've started looking at that purely because uh, the matrices get quite large um, with that kind of tokenization. Um, I haven't looked into it far enough, but I want to start breaking up on date and specific commands and then arguments afterwards because the the command itself can tell you a lot, and then the arguments, especially if you're looking at Docker, the kinds of exploits recently on the TCP daemon and the file system, uh, it's very specifically crafted exploits. So I should be able to get something from that. But this is kind of, like I said, it's not the full research yet. It's kind of just the first proof of concept so that I can write the thesis and then continue to more granular tokenization. I'm trying to use things that would be applicable to more than just Cisco logs, but if I make it more granular to Cisco logs, I'd probably break it down to date time, um, which gives me the ability to look at it in time series as well, and then command and the actual arguments itself. And then um, what Sys, uh, Sysdig also um, enables. Yeah, so the idea is that regex, regex is a great tool, but after some time the wheels might come off a bit if you're constantly updating regexes. So I'm not trying to replace regex. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure where the example is, but for instance, um, Sysdig also tells you kind of in which direction the call is going. So it's also, there should also be some, yeah, there should be a lot more that you can get out of it. But I'm definitely not trying to replace regexes or even Elasticsearch. So um, I've worked with Elasticsearch quite a lot, and I'm, I'm trying to get my hands on some data to use their seam and just the anomaly detection. Um, they bought the company because that anomaly detection is excellent and um, time series. So I'm trying to avoid time series here at the moment, but even time series gives you a lot of power because you're not just looking at the anomaly itself. With time series, you could look at additional log at the same time, um, maybe combining uh, execution and a network log uh, to see how it fits into the bigger picture rather than just looking at a single anomaly. But this would be kind of a first pass, and then the second pass would be to look at contextual anomaly to try and understand it within the system. So if you're looking at Kubernetes, where there's a lot of things working together, you'd want to know um, the internal networking and the container itself, what the anomaly is. Um, so how much effort is it going to be to train the models on these things? When, like, say, for example, you built a tool now that you can use, hook it up to your logs, um, then obviously you're going to need So for the most part, choosing KNN is 
is to make it easier so that we use a baseline and everything else is different. But um, I've started and it's a really long process to actually go through a really big log and mark each one as um, safe or unsafe uh, to train another model. But the idea is to make it as simple as possible, at least for this version of the research. If I'd go further on more studies, I'd, I'd, I'd do it more complex. But a lot of the existing um, stuff, you need some kind of baseline and examples, train the model. And unfortunately, the problem with the baseline is the more it changes, the system changes, more changes. Because remember, there's positive changes as well, right? We're developers, we add things, we make mistakes. So now you're flagging those as anomalies as well. So it's not a silver bullet, but... Sorry, just a thought. If you're looking at, for example, an anomaly caused by someone breaking into your system, it might be possible to get a safe... Um, example log, very basic one, just by turning off your networking and taking that log and marking the entire thing as safe. Then of course, any form of networking will not be marked, so you'd have to go through your networking and, things and do that manually, but then it at least manually, it automatically handles anything that's not networking. That's possible. Um. Just, just try and repeat that again. So, wait, do you want to mark anything new as anomalous? No what, no, what I'm saying is you start with a system with the network and turned off. Yes. You know there's nobody breaking in because there's no networking. Okay? So, you mark that entire log as safe. And new things, if you just do that, then, you, then anything with a network will be marked anomalous, basically. You would have to go th then through a secondary process where you take the networking stuff and you say these networking things are safe, these networking things are unsafe, but you've got everything that's not networking done much more quickly. That's possible, but um, <laughs> I, I, it's hard to think of a thing that's not using the network. So if you look at, let's say, Elasticsearch in a container, the first thing it does if it's not in a single node mode is to look for any other node being around it. So I, I'd i have to look into that, but I think it not being able to find the others would then cause it would, anomalies it would in future. It would change things dramatically, but things like when it opens a file and looks at a file and all of that would all be automatically marked safe. So you just filter all those out and then manually handle the remaining things. That's a possibility. That, yeah, so I mean, I chose Cisco logs because I could see some of the network and some of the executions, but I mean, you could also even just go and say the application log itself, just focus on that, that's safe, um, and then do the network separately, etc. cetera. But um, I wanted to look beyond just the network um, because um, um, the initial research was also to look at problems that developers would create, vulnerabilities of code changes coming in. So there's not necessarily an initial network call coming in causing the problem. So that, that, that would have made it much harder to detect because you're not looking for the network first. Um, but, but, but I get what you're saying. Um, we were talking about this at... DC 2711 this weekend is that medical devices don't actually store execution logs at all. The only thing that you could have is configuration logs, um, the patient's data, and then the actual network around it. So that would be the only thing to even look at at all. But here we are assuming that we could look at execution and the network. I'd, I'd have to, I'm, I'm going to go think about that one a little bit more, just because of how I'm thinking that actually not being able to connect out might cause data points that then would show that it connecting is the opposite behavior of what it's exe like expecting. Thank you. <laughs>